So if you, on, on this one, just to illustrate the, uh, uh, the principle, it's a few, a few examples. Um, these, these generalized calculations, there's uh, uh, quite a lot of them in the, in the literature on, on, on a whole range of topics. I'll just give you just four examples, very briefly. Is one paper, Energy and Greenhouse Gas Cost of Living for Australia. And one famous diagram that you see everywhere is, is this one. Okay, this is income, household income, say in dollars, and this is, um, let's say, embodied, embodied emissions, or emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or you can put energy in here or water, it's all the same basically. Now, there's two components to this, there's uh, first of all, um, this, this bit here, what we call direct, that is the energy that is used in the household, and this is indirect. This is what's embodied in the goods and services the household purchases. Now this, or well you can, you get from statistics basically, you see what, um, you know, how much people say spend on gas or electricity and in, or, or so on, you don't, you know exactly straight away well, how much, you know, um, a megajoule of ga gas costs or petrol or whatever and you can calculate this. This you can, on this portion you can only calculate using input output analysis because you need to calculate multipliers, these emissions multipliers and multiply with uh, that with final demand. Uh, this household expenditure here, this, this household income or expenditure is a substitute for income if you don't have income that is precisely what you use in this vector y. And then you can calculate um, e, which is basically what's here on the y-axis. So here you see um, that, the first of all, the majority of a greenhouse gas or, en or energy budget is indirect, it's the indirect proportion, and also that this direct one is pretty flat. What this means is that basically um, in here, sort of gas and electricity and, and fuels and, and petrol and such, they're essential goods. Uh, if, you, if you earn, you know, uh, if you earn twice as much, you don't consume twice as much petrol. There's only so much you can, you can uh, consume. However, with these things, um, they, they increase quite strongly initially, and then they flatten out at higher incomes, which means that as you earn money, uh, you're poor and you become richer, you consume a lot more services, you need a lot more energy and cause a lot more emissions, and eventually, eventually, um, it peters out here. But this is not because you consume sort of less, become richer and richer and richer, but what you consume changes. Uh, down here you buy fridges and cars and stuff, and up here you buy uh, newspapers, and here you buy tickets to the opera or something. You know? So these are not very energy intensive. Anyway, this, this diagram can, can also sit in, in lots of publications. And I would say that um, people have asked, well, what about if you go income, if, if it becomes higher and higher and higher? Can uh, go down again? In other words, is there a Kuznets effect? So Kuznets is a famous, famous economy, economist. Is there a Kuznets effect? It means if, if, if societies only get rich enough, will the environmental impact or the energy impact go down? And um, for the seminar, for that lecture, I recommend uh, that you use the, uh, a paper that was printed in the journal Energy in 2006, and which is a five-country study on exactly this relationship and a comparison between those countries. Similar study um, exists for, for Sydney households, and once again, um, a similar relationship here in figure two of the Sydney paper. You can see that, for example, Fairfield, Liverpool, uh, the overall um, energy budget is low, so they're about here, but the energy intensity, meaning the slope, of that curve is pretty high because what they buy is fridges and cars and that. Whilst you go to the North Shore, the total energy body is very high, but the intensity is not very high because what they buy at the margin here are services. So this is really good to, sh you can really well illustrate this using those maps. 
Well, here you've seen that you can, uh, this Y, we've inserted household expenditure for that. But you can insert other things for that Y as well. And uh, there's another study here printed in Agricultural Systems that uh, Richard Wood is the first author. And uh, this is about the environmental impacts of conventional and organic farming. It's a comparative study. And you can, well, the question is, is organic farming really better? Of course, we know that organic pro uh, products are marketed because of the, um, the absence of chemicals in the agricultural process. But what about greenhouse? What about energy? What about water? So um, this, this paper gives a, um, a, um, a few examples of, of, um, of how you can, for example, uh, insert the budget of a farm into, into a wire. And finally, it's the last one for, for this lecture, there's a, a paper on the second Sydney airport. It was printed in Environmental Impact Assessment Review in 2003. Okay? And this is, we inserted in this way, a, a budget for a proposed Sydney airport and calculated um, the uh, water emissions and labour consequences of this second Sydney airport proposal. Um, and what we found, uh, we actually compared our calculations with an existing uh, EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, and we found that because we used input-output analysis, our numbers were all higher because we included all those indirect regional and national supply chains, which uh, in the EIS they, they uh, could, not, uh, could not arrive at just simply because they hadn't used input-output analysis. But these are sort of a few examples for generalized input-output calculations.